Right, so we'd, uh, last time we proved the bare category theorem for complete metric spaces. And uh, I spotted a typo afterwards where I had one n that should have been a k, one little index there. So uh, if you spot that n, it should have been a little k. When most of the time I got them right, but uh, there was one intersection there where I got it wrong. So it should have been the intersection from k equals 1 to n of uk and not un. OK, and then we used lemma 1.4 to finish off the proof. And uh, we talked a bit about the irrationals and how that was a countable intersection of a sequence of dense open subsets of the real line. Here's an example from the lecture before showing you something that happens with the rationals. Um, this, again, is an example of a countable collection of dense open subsets of the rationals whose intersection is empty, which is one of the ways of seeing that the rationals can't be complete metrizable, because here's a countable collection of dense open sets whose intersection is not dense. But the other way is to use the result we were talking about at the end last time, Uh, right, so we talked about the G delta sets, and then we were just talking about this corollary 1.7. So in corollary 1.7, you've got a countably infinite complete metric space, um, or complete metrizable, but it doesn't make any difference. And the claim is that it must have at least one isolated point. And I'll prove that directly from Bayer category theorem as a proof by contradiction. But first, let me remind you what an isolated point is. So you've got a point of a topological space X. So you've got little x in big X, and you want to know what does it mean to say that that is an isolated point. Or you could say that X is isolated in X because it might you might well want to say what you're isolated in. Again, isolated point of X or isolated in X. You could be isolated in one thing but not isolated in another. So, again, you have to be careful. Um, if, I mean, you better have the definition. Anybody uh, know a definition of what an isolated point is in a topological space? Anyone want to suggest a definition? Okay, so if you take the single point set, which has just got that point in, it should already be open. So you have to be a little bit careful about saying little x is open, because of course, strictly speaking, that wouldn't make sense. So, uh, so well, you can think of it as sort of forming an open set on its own, but somehow a point, an element of a set can't be open because to be an open set you should be a subset of your set. And, so, and you sometimes have to distinguish between points and uh, between elements and sets, you sometimes have to be careful. So, now if you think about all the situations where you've met isolated points before, um, you'll see that this works. Notice that if you're an isolated point, you must be in every dense subset.
because otherwise you'd have a non-empty open set which A didn't have any elements of. So any dense set has to include all the isolated points of your topological space. However, if X is not isolated, that means that the rest of the set is dense. So it's a sort of converse. So conversely, if X is not isolated, then if you take away that point, you get a dense set. Does that set x take away little x have to be open? No, it doesn't have to be open because in general you don't expect single point sets to be closed. On the other hand, they often are. What's the What's a typical condition you put on a topological space that ensures that... Is that yes, that's right. So, so that's more than you really need. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a whole load of conditions called T0, T1, T2, and so on. And uh, points being closed is uh, something like T1, I think. Um, Hausdorff is T2. Um, so Hausdorff is slightly stronger than points being closed. But if you are a Hausdorff topological space then points will be closed. And in particular, if you're a metric space, then points will be closed. Um, so if X is, a, is Hausdorff, e.g. if X is a metric space, that's a typical example, then... Uh, points will be closed, or single point sets will be closed, so x take away x will also be open. And so, if you've got lots of... Yes? Uh, is it obvious from the definition of complex stuff, uh, if it is open, then uh, No, actually, it's a little exercise. Um, it was done in, our met in, at least, when I teach metric and topological spaces, it's on one of the question sheets. Um, it's, it's not a very hard exercise, but it's, uh, you know, it's about taking unions of open sets and getting open sets and things like that. Um, and that's how it works. I mean, you, you show that the complement of the point is open by noting that for every point in there, you can find a little open set round it that doesn't touch the point. And then you take the union of all those. So, uh, yeah, yeah uh, you, you followed that one. Yeah, so, uh, so it's a little exercise, if you haven't seen it before, that every housed off topological space, single point sets are closed. And when you do that exercise, you'll see that you don't need the full force of Hausdorff, because you only need to be able to find a little open set round the alien point that doesn't have the first point in it. Um, and you don't need both open sets, you only need one of them as long as it's around the right point. Uh, right, so, so now we return to the result we want. So now, um, we're going to prove this result whose number I've forgotten. Which number, are we, which number is this result? The, is it 3.7? 1.7? 1.7. I really should try to have a copy of these things in front of me. Uh, right, so we want to prove... Let's have the proof of 1.7. So let X then be a complete metric space such that x is countably infinite.
And what we'll do, uh, we'll show that x has at least one isolated point. And then an easy induction shows how you can pull out a sequence of isolated points that way because you've got, your, you've got your first isolated point, then you throw it away, and the rest of the set is still a complete metric space because it's a closed subset of the original. Um, so it's still a complete metric space, so it must have another isolated point. And then you get rid of that, and then you must have another isolated point, and that shows you get a sequence of them. So... The rest is that an easy induction. Okay, let's suppose for contradiction then that X has no isolated points. Then, um, well, for each x in x, the complement is now a dense open set. So for each x in x, uh, we set u sub x equal x take away x. Since x is not isolated, it's dense. Since it's a metric space, it's, it's open. Now, there's only countable many points in X, so when we intersect all of these, it's a countable intersection of open set, dense open sets. So by the Bayer category theorem, um, the intersection of X in X, of UX, is a countable intersection well, it is a countable intersection of dense open sets, by the very category theorem, it should be dense. Perhaps we'd be better to say, I'm going to rephrase that as then the intersection is a counter intersection of dense open set, so it should be dense by the bare category theorem. That sounds a bit better. On the other hand, what is that intersection? Well, it has at least one point. Well, by bare category theorem, it should be dense and have at least one point. So you're right, but it is also the empty set, correct? Because um, UX says throw away the point X. If you intersect them all, you've thrown away all the points of the set. Intersection X in X of UX. That's the intersection over X in X of X take away the point X. So you throw away all the points. So that's the empty set. That's a contradiction. We were supposed to get a contradiction. So X must have at least one isolated point.
and I'll leave, it, I'll leave the rest to you to show that it must have infinitely many isolated points. Um, but there's a nice false argument that every point must be isolated, and that's going to be on one of the question sheets. It's not true, and you can find, give a counterexample to show it's not true. But on the other hand, the false argument is quite fun. So uh, you, have to, you're, you're, you get a chance to uh, tell me what's wrong with the false argument. That's going to be on, um, I can't remember which question sheet, but uh, I'll give it to you soon. So it must have infinitely many isolated points, but that doesn't mean that all of the points must be isolated. I think there were some comments on the next slide, uh, on the same slide about different kinds of spaces where a uh, bare category theorem works. And uh, you, don't, you don't just have to use complete metric spaces. You can do bare category theorem in compact Hausdorff spaces and things like that. Um, but let's move on to some very important reformulations. Reformulations of, well, in some sense, some of the versions of this are going to look a bit weaker than bare category theorem. And uh, I can never remember whether you can recover the, strong, the full strength version from the weaker ones. But let's, uh, let's see what we can find out. Uh, so, notation for the closure of a set. I will use either one of these. Either write the letters CLOS for closure, or I might put a bar over the top depending on the setting I'm in. Um, when it's a long, complicated expression in brackets, it's sometimes slightly clearer to put uh, the word closure in front. Um, or you can put it all in brackets and put a line at the end. There, there's lots of different notation you can use, but uh, here's our notation then for closure. For interior, I use, the, again, the Roman letters INT, you can put a little circle over the top if you want. Um, there are various other ways of doing interior. And then I'll, occasionally I might use this little C at the top for complement. So there's a slight issue here. Some people put a bar over the top to mean complement. And of course it could mean complex conjugation. So there's at least three different meanings for bar over the top. If I use bar over the top, I mean closure most of the time. Um, except possibly in the last chapter on Banach algebra. Uh, for the little c at the top, again, sometimes people use that to mean closure, but I'm using it for complement. So just so you know. You need to know which set you're taking the complement in. But for example, I can save a bit of writing by saying that q complement is equal to r take away q so I could write Q complement for the irrational numbers, as long as you know I'm working in the real numbers and taking complements there. So basically in that case, X is real numbers. Yes, okay. that's right. So here I would take X to be the real numbers and Q complement would then be our takeaway Q. Whereas, of course, I could take X to be Q, and if, if I might be, if X was Q as my topological space, then Q complement would suddenly be the empty set. Um, so if you want, I'll put that provision in when X equals R. OK, so now we've got a topological space, and I want to say what it means for a set to be nowhere dense. So this is, uh, this is a stronger condition than not being dense. It's sort of like saying, not only is it not dense, there isn't even any part of the topological space. Any, there's no significant part of the topological space where this set is dense. Um, but significant, you have to interpret a bit liberally. Uh, so, the most straightforward definition, but that doesn't, isn't that revealing, is that the interior of the closure of A should be empty. What you should think of it is that, uh, okay, you're dense if your closure is the whole thing, and then you meet every non-empty open set. 
But maybe if you restrict attention to some sort of open subset of your space, you might find that that bit of A that lived there was dense in that bit of the space. And so what this is asking is, could you find a non-empty open set in your space so that when you intersect A with it, you get a dense subset of that open subset? So that's uh, one way to think about it. But on the other hand, you can just work with it as interior closure being empty. Now, if the set is already closed, then you're just asking for it to have empty interior. So that makes, for closed sets, being nowhere dense is very easy. It just means no interior. And uh, Bear worked with sets which are called sets of first category and sets of second category. A set of first category, and I won't be using this terminology, is a countable union of nowhere dense sets. And those sets are also called meagre sets. Um, so and let me write this down so at least you know what's going on. Um, terminology. A meagre set. or a set of first category, in the sense of bear, is a countable union of no dense sets. So in some sense, these, the idea is that a meagre set should be relatively small. But then on the other hand, if you're working in the rationals, um, if you take one point in the rationals, of course, it's nowhere dense. Um, rationals have got no isolated points. So if you take one point in the rationals, um, it's nowhere dense. But if you take a union of all of the countervailing points in the rationals, you get the rationals. So the rationals is a, meag is a meagre subset of itself. Um, which is another way of seeing that the rationals is a rather bad topological space. Because um, the bare category field tells you that no non-empty complete metric space can be a meagre subset of itself. Uh, so bare used second category to mean uh, not a first category. So, uh, so he said that... Uh, no complete metric space can be a first category in itself. It's not immediately obvious what the connection between the bare category theorem and this is, though. We're going to have to think about that a little bit. So let's have a quick look at that. So if you remember some of the things I said, I said uh, a set was dense if and only if the complement had empty interior. So that's a, a good start to think about. So let X be a topological space. And let B be a subset of X. Um, then B is dense in X, if and only if the complement of B has empty interior. Uh, mind I just write that as the interior of the complement is empty. Well, so if you take complements in that, so the complement of a set is dense, if and only if the set itself has got empty interior. So what does it mean to say that A closure has empty interior? It's exactly the same as saying the complement of A closure is dense. So that's what's going on here. And again, if you've got a closed set, then you're nowhere dense if and only if the complement is dense. Because again, that's the set should have empty interior. That's the same as saying the complement should be dense. So this is the connections between interiors and closures and denseness and all that. Any questions about, about these equivalences? Any? 
Do they all seem reasonable, or we'd like to say a bit more about them? Are you, uh, are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So, so now, once you've got that, we can use the Bayer Category Theorem and De Morgan's rules to get the next thing. And this one is a direct take complements in the Bayer Category Theorem result. So if you take a sequence of nowhere dense subsets of X, then, well, you can then look at their closures, and that means you've got a sequence of closed sets whose um, interiors are empty. Why don't I just uh, write something down about this? So here, interior of A enclosure is empty, whichever notation you use for closure. Um, so, um, the complement X take away closure of AN is dense and open. So if you intersect all of those, you'll get something that's dense. And the intersection of all of those, by De Morgan's theorem, is X take away the union, which is this thing. So by Bayer Category Theorem, the intersection of natural numbers N of uh, X take away the closure of AN is dense in X. And then the rest is De Morgan's rules. So then you get uh, this one. And uh, because X is non empty, that means that uh, the union is definitely not equal to X. And it's just the not equal to x bit that is usually the most important thing for us. The fact that the complement is dense is usually less important than the fact that you can't get the whole of x this way. And, they, and that's, the, uh, that's exactly what I just said. No non-empty complete metric space is the union of a sequence of nowhere dense sets. Or in other words, no non-empty complete metric space is meagre in itself. So X is not a first category in itself. X is not a meagre subset of itself. All different ways of saying the same thing, valid for non-empty complete metric spaces. Unfortunately, the empty complete metric space is a bit of a nuisance, um, because the empty complete metric space is, is meagre in itself, um, but who cares about the empty set? Well, we do, but uh, we'll avoid it. Any questions about that formulation of the bare category theorem? We're going to use that again and again and again when we're doing results about functional analysis. Uh, you can also go back and think about the rational numbers and see how, again, it's another way of proving there must be at least one um, isolated point there. You see, if you take a union of a sequence of points and get the whole thing, well, they can't all be nowhere dense. So at least one of the points must be somewhere dense. But for a point to be somewhere dense, it's got to be isolated. In this setting, of course. Um, that's not true if you didn't have uh, points being closed, I guess, in general. You might have to watch out for that.
So now if you do it with closed sets, then you don't have to close them anymore. And remember that a closed set is no ident, even only if it's got empty interior. So you've got a non-empty complete metric space, and it's a union of some sequence of closed sets. Then we know they can't all be nowhere dense, so at least one of them must be, well, whatever the opposite of nowhere dense is, which I guess I'm saying somewhere dense, though I haven't defined that. Um, so at least one of these closed sets must fail to be nowhere dense, which means at least one of these closed sets must have some interior to it. And that's an immediate corollary then, just from the definition of nowhere dense. And as I said, again, um, you can now use that and, and give another proof for corollary 1.7, um, which was the one about having uh, lots of isolated points if you're a countable infinite complete metric space. And that brings us to the end of that uh, chapter. So any questions on anything we had in that chapter? All right, so we'll stop there for the moment.